Chapter 10. What's up with that? You think you're better than us? Samson, 10th grade. Samson, George, and Ramik seemed to fall into each other's lives around the middle of 9th grade. Ramik had watched and admired George and Sam's friendship from a distance at first, but soon, through sports as well as academics, the three of them ended up hanging together on a regular basis. By 10th grade, they had forged a steady friendship. The classes were easy for the three of them, and they all enjoyed outsmarting the teachers and running the halls, taking every school rule to its limit. They found they had much in common, telling jokes, talking trash, laughing at crazy things their teachers did, shooting hoops in the gym, and listening to rap music as loud as they could crank it up. Samson, for one, was glad to have someone to share his thoughts with. Late one night, the three of them sat in the empty bleachers at school. The night was clear, the moon was bright, and talk came easy. You think there's life on other planets? George asked. Ramik laughed. <laughs> well, if there is, I hope they got it together better than we do down here. Too much drugs and crime down here, Samson said. And killing, George added. And girls who won't go out with us, Ramik added with a chuckle. Speak for yourself, man, Samson laughed. I got more girls than I know what to do with. And I don't even have a car. Just me riding on my Nikes. Why do you think kids at school think making good grades is stupid? George asked. It's a school where everybody's supposed to be smart and do good. I don't get it, Ramik said. None of us really has a blueprint on how to make it, Samson said. Right now, all I know is I can't let the streets swallow me. I have to get mine. And what will that be? Ramik asked him. I don't know yet, but I want more than what I see every day on the blocks, Samson replied. You got that right, Ramik said. You ever have trouble telling your boys that you don't want to do something? George asked quietly. All the time, the others answered together. I ain't scared of them, Ramik said, and I ain't scared of what they think of me, but you don't want to look stupid or scared or weak, George finished for him. Yeah, something like that, Ramik agreed. A lot of times it's just easier to go along than to say something, George added. But I ain't backing down from nobody, Samson asserted loudly. They push me too far, and I'll give them something to think about. Ramik, who could also fight as easily as he could do a math problem in his head, nodded with understanding. It's all about power, man. Sometimes it just feels good, you know? That rush you get when you're connecting with somebody's gut, or when you're getting away with something wrong. You feel me? Samson asked. Yeah, man, I know what you're talking about, Ramik replied. The talk faded as the night air got chilly and they headed to their homes. Samson remembered that conversation well a few weeks later when he walked with a friend named Frank down Ludlow Street one rainy night. They passed by what used to be Twin City Skating Rink, once known as the hottest rink in Newark. People had traveled from all parts of Newark to be a part of the skating crowd. It was only one block away from the Dayton Street projects. Too bad they closed the skating rink, Samson said with a sigh. Good music, slick skates, plenty of fine girls hanging around too. Yeah, man, but the police got tired of breaking up fights or taking reports from kids who got beat up or got their stuff stolen. If it wasn't for the bus, lots more kids would have been tromped by Dayton Street Boys, Samson replied with a laugh. You know, lots of them spent their days just waiting in front of the rink, spotting targets to attack and rip off. Well, you know New Art. You stay on your side of town, everything will be fine. You come over here to the skating rink, you get your butt beat. That's just the way it is, Frank shrugged. After that murder last year, there was no way, that, no way they'd keep the skating rink open, Samson said. Too bad, he repeated as the rain trickled down his back. A man who looked vaguely familiar walked up to the two of them. Hey man, let me hold two dollars, he said to Frank. I don't got it, Frank replied. Man, I know you got two dollars, don't play with me. Give me the money. I don't got it, Frank repeated loudly this time. Without another word, the stranger, who was wearing a black, goose-down jacket, lifted up his shirt and pulled out a gun. Samson tensed, ready for whatever he would have to do. What about you? The man asked. I know you got two dollars. Very calmly, Samson replied, I ain't got it, man. Samson knew firsthand that many people in the neighborhood were desperate and wouldn't think twice about taking his life. What if I shoot both of you? The man asked them angrily. I could shoot you right now. Samson and Frank said nothing, but turned and walked away. Samson waited for bullets to slice through his back, but he heard nothing but his thudding heart in the falling rain. 
Samson thought back to the days of his kung fu lessons with Reggie. It had all seemed so simple then. Forget about outside problems, Reggie had said. Concentrate your thoughts on a positive flow of energy. But Samson knew he needed more than positive energy to escape angry men with guns. He felt trapped. Several weeks later, January 19 to be exact, Samson was celebrating his birthday with some friends. They decided the best way to do that was with a little beer and a little liquor. So they drove around Newark looking for a place to park and get right. Yo, man, it's your birthday, a dude named Hawk said. Light up and let's celebrate together. He gave Samson a package but appeared to be cocaine. Word up, word up, Samson replied, not committing himself either way. Hawk suggested, let's make a woolly. Samson knew what a woolly was. He watched as Hawk took the tobacco out of a regular cigarette and then mixed it with the cocaine. Then he wrapped the loaded cigarette back into its paper. Hawk lit it, then passed it to the guy sitting closest to him. The dude took two puffs, then zonked out. His head bounced against the back of the car seat. Hawk then offered it to Samson. It's your birthday, man. We love you. Go, You go now. Samson hesitated. Even the smoke from the thing was making him feel dizzy. Nah, man, that ain't me, he declared. Samson wasn't tempted to do drugs the way many of his friends were. He'd seen too much destruction and devastation in the lives because of that. And he didn't like feeling out of control. What's up with that? You think you're better than us? Hawk replied angrily. Nah, dog, I'm just too faded right now, Samson said. Besides, you know I don't get high. They didn't like it, but they backed off, mostly because very soon all of them were too high to care. Samson jumped out of the car and left them there, glad to be able to breathe fresh air and celebrate his birthday with a clear head and a clean conscience. But it was hard for him. He knew his options were limited. He was reaching a point in life where the despair and negativity were threatening to take over his life. A few months later, on a hot summer day, Samson and a guy named Spud were kicking it on the corner. <clears throat> they were dressed like most of the boys in the neighborhood. Jeans, sneakers, and white tank tops. The two of them had been friends ever since they were in Mrs. Davis's third grade class together and had played in the same Pop Warner football team. Summer days were long, and summer programs didn't exist, so the two of them were left with lots of times and nothing to fill it with. Yo, man, I got a way for us to make some money. Spud said. What do you got in mind? Asked Samson. Put up some cash, we'll get some crap, then we'll split the profits. Easy money. Big money. Sounds good, man, but I don't know. I don't want to get caught up in no drug stuff, Samson replied. It's not like drugs will die up, dry up and die if you don't participate, man, Spud told him. Yeah, you got that right, Samson said. He sure could use the money, and it would be nice to help his mother and family. Finances were tied around the house. His mother was always struggling to find ways to pay the mortgage, keep the electricity on, and feed all the children. Don't worry about it. Everybody's doing it, man, Spud said. Come with me tonight up to Harlem. I'll show you how it's done. Samson agreed, and late that night, the two of them took a train all the way uptown to Harlem in New York City. They brought a girl with them so they wouldn't look too suspicious. They walked to an apartment where a man stood in the doorway wearing a gun and a holster. He patted them down like Samson had seen cops do on the street. They entered a tiny room inside of the house. It was filthy. Bags of drugs were piled on the table. Men with large guns stood all around, ready to shoot in an instant. To Samson, it looked like a scene from a movie. Spud and Samson passed their money to the man and it, to the men, and in return they were given a plastic bag of crack cocaine. This was the first time that Samson had ever picked up drugs. As they stepped out of the house, Samson looked up and noticed the misty rain glistening in the streetlight. What have I got myself into, he thought painfully. Easy score, Spud said, seemingly unaffected by the horror of the situation. Hey, man, I'm out of here, Samson said suddenly. You take all the money, all of it. This ain't me. Instead of complaining, Spud just shrugged. Catch you later, man. With that, he disappeared into the night. Samson went home, relieved that once more he'd been able to navigate the delicate road between what was right and what was real. I often imagined myself in a different world, one not filled with murder, drugs, gang, crime, and negativity. But that was only my imagination, not my reality. Regardless of where I turned, there was always another malignant situation brewing, waiting for the right moment to take my life. In spite of all that, 
I chose to turn away from the drug scene. I saw too many friends and family members succumb to its powerful destruction. When youth in my neighborhood looked for an outlet of expression, drugs were always easily available. Getting into the drug game was as easy as buying a ticket for the train or bus. But that was a trip I didn't want to take. If the way I, ma- if the way I managed to turn down drugs sounds like it, was, it wasn't extremely difficult, don't get me wrong, it was. Not only was it really hard, but it was continuous. Every single day offered options to give up and give in. I saw many of my friends buy new cars, jewelry, and clothes with drug money they had earned. It would have been so easy to give in to the drug-induced, mind-numbing relief from the problems and despair all around me. I was driven and had to remain strong to avoid all the temptations. I couldn't help but wonder why more wasn't being done to prevent the surplus of drug trafficking in urban neighborhoods like mine. It seemed to me like nobody really cared. The political powers were aware, but never fully committed themselves to making a difference.